Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming along tonight. Um, the, my name is Frank Dorn. I'm the uh, chair of the, um, what, what's officially called the, the Speaker's Advisory Committee on Works of Art um, in the House of Commons. And uh, we've organised this particular event. Um, and it's important for us to be in this territory. Um, I was just saying just now to um, our speaker this evening that um, we have a significant deficit in our arts collection of portraits or anything to do with women because our, our collection goes back several centuries and uh, you didn't get the chance to get into our collection because none of you were elected. <laughs> and uh, thankfully that's changed. But there are other things which haven't changed and I think uh, the decision of the Church of England yesterday was a disappointing reminder of how far we've still got to go. Anyway, the, the talk is, this talk is a part of the ongoing Parliament and Votes for Women series of talks, uh, displays and events uh, which have been initiated by the House of Commons Works of Art Committee and uh, there'll be more as we move on, particularly next year with the centenary of the death of M Emily Wilding Davison, uh, Davison, which is an important event. And um, this talk is also part of Parliament Week. You'll have seen the display down in the, in the Westminster Hall. The leaflets available telling you more about uh, other events, including mock suffragette trials at the Royal Courts of Justice, I'm told, and uh, our Democratic Heritage's suffrage walk, for which there are flyers available. <coughs> I've also to let you know that this talk is being filmed and will be available shortly on Parliament's YouTube channel. It's also a perfect opportunity, those of you who still got the enthusiasm of the suffragette movement, to have a protest, perhaps at the fact that you've got a male chair tonight. <laughs> That's, uh, who knows? Um, Elizabeth Crawford is our speaker tonight. She's a renowned suffrage historian. Anyone who's any interest uh, in women's suffrage will be familiar with her work. And I was given this poem. I'm not on commission, but uh, this is the... I, saw, I, I, I only saw this today, and I've managed to dip into it and find all of the important suffragettes from Aberdeen, so I'll take that knowledge back with me <laughs> when I go back to my constituency. Um, <clears throat> but um, her, her public, uh, uh, the publications, of course, include that invaluable encyclopedic reference guide, um, and um, she's also published on the Garretts, a family who played a pivotal role uh, in the development of women's rights in Britain. She is extremely generous with her research, as those of you who follow her information-packed blog, Women and Her Sphere, will know. And I'm delighted that she's agreed to give us this talk tonight on her current research subject, Kate Perry Fry, a worker of the suffrage movement and a daughter of an MP. After the talk uh, fr uh, the, from Elizabeth, there will be the opportunity for questions. Okay, thanks very much. Elizabeth. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm very pleased that so many of you have come out on a wet night. Um, but uh, I have to think back to um, a summer's day on uh, Thursday, the 7th of July, 1892. 14-year-old Kate Fry ended her diary entry for the day with, I went to bed at half past one o'clock after the most exciting and pleasing day I have ever gone through. And what had made the day so exciting? Well, as the first sentence of the entry explains, this was Papa's election day for Parliament. Kate Fry, and there she is, that was a photograph taken about 1913 when she was the suffrage organiser. Uh, but uh, Kate uh, Fry was a diary writer, and she made her first attempt in 1887 when she was nine, and uh, was soon composing entries every day, decade after decade, until October uh, 1958, just uh, two or three months or so before her death at the age of 81. And um, here's the span of her diary. I mean, you can see that's the first page where she just uh, wrote out a few brief entries for the year, and that's the last one. And she does end on quite a happy note saying, you know, the day had got better and she was feeling better. So that was whether she had a stroke, I think, probably very quickly. But you can see the strong writing carrying to the end. And this is a volume of the diary. Um, this uh, one, and she put, she stuck things in. I mean, vast amount of wonderful suffrage ephemera, which uh, 
I'll be showing you and which she'll be in the book, but she just wrote every day. And because she wasn't confined, uh, well, she didn't use purpose-made diaries until the middle of the First World War. So she used these um, big tomes, which she carried around the country with her. And uh, that one covers about 18 months. Um, and uh, I mean, you can see it wasn't just um, a day a page. It, it went uh, a considerable length. And um, I can't claim that uh, Kate was an exceptional woman, although naturally she seems so to herself, but she did write well in a readable, straightforward style with amusing moments of self-awareness. And by luck, her diary and, that, and an archive of associated material has survived, and that's a whole other story. But what makes it particularly interesting is that for a time she was chronicling the political life of the day as an insider, an insider of sorts in her teenage years as the ingenuous observer of her father, who was MP, uh, Liberal MP for North Kensington, and then in her 20s and 30s as an active participant in the women's suffrage movement. And um, the book that I'm uh, about to publish, uh, it's called Campaigning for the Vote, and I've edited out of her diary, I've edited all the suffrage entries um, covering the years just 1911 to 1915. She was involved in the suffrage before, but uh, that was when she was being paid um, in the London, she was working in London and in the provinces as an organiser for one of the lesser known suffrage societies. And as far as I know, no other diary um, survives. It gives us such a clear view of an organiser's daily life as she travelled round the Edwardian shares, attempting to interest uh, the populace in the cause of women's suffrage. Um, for Kate Fry had the benefit of immersion in politics from an early age. For on that day in July uh, 1892, Kate's father, Frederick Fry, was standing in the general election as the progressive liberal candidate for North Kensington. And she preserved a copy of his election address. There it is. And she preserved that in a scrapbook. And uh, besides um, the items that I've highlighted that were in his address, um, it, he also called for one man, one vote, and no man more than one. And for three weeks before the election, Kate had been noting in her diary details of the canvassing that was dominating the Fry household, such as on the 17th of June. Did not have any lessons, but folded circulars all the morning. And it's the kind of thing, I'm sure these details that uh, the, the families of MPs uh, would be familiar with. And with her mother and sister, she attended many of Frederick Fry's election meetings, and she could be a, a critical observer, because of one she wrote, it was crammed and was a splendid meeting. Mr. Robson was in the chair, Mr. Routledge spoke splendidly, Daddy spoke very badly. <laughs> <laughs> of another, in the evening, we all went to Papa's biggest meeting, held at the Labrook Hall. It was packed, hundreds standing. Dr. Clifford spoke, Dr. Horn, Mr. Routledge, Mr. Roberts, besides Papa and Mr. Robson, who took the chair, and a black man. And I've been wondering if that black man, as uh, she says, may have been uh, Dadabi Nuraji, who was uh, Britain's first black MP, who was elected at that uh, same election as uh, the MP for Central Finsbury. But she obviously thought it was uh, worth noting his, uh, his presence, even though she didn't know his name. And during the election campaign, Kate was sometimes called upon to do rather more than stuff envelopes to decorate the platform. For on July the 4th, in the evening, Mother Agnes, that was her sister and I, uh, were sent to try and convert a man who did not like Home Rule for Ireland, though he did, said he liked Mr Fry in nearly everything else. He wouldn't be converted, so we left him. <laughs> <laughs> and then... On election day, Kate described how there were heaps of banners and papa's bills about, and equally many of Mr. Thompson Sharps, and that was the Conservative uh, candidate. He's making a dreadful struggle for the seat. Mother Agnes and I went to the central committee room, and papa went with us in a carriage round to all the polling stations, and never in all my life saw such a sight. We were cheered, and little children ran after the carriage, shouting, Vote for Fry! They had Papa's photograph and yellow bills stuck in their caps and all over them. 
for orange or its shades of yellow then as now was the liberal colour and Kate mentions that she and Agnes had special dresses for election day of a sort of yellowish fawn trimmed with black lace and worry and she wore an orange liberal rosette and here it is it was preserved in the pages of the diary saying uh, I wore uh, on general election Thursday July the 7th and there it is still <laughs> as she wore it pinned to her, her dress. And it survived, I mean, that's 125, 120 years it's uh, survived in uh, the pages of her diary. And Kate then recounts how in the evening, decked out in liberal colours, she and her sister were given a ringside view of uh, the declaration. They were taken to Barker's store in Kensington High Street, where the housekeeper led them right up through the shop up to the showrooms in the front where they opened the windows and put sheets on a sort of parapet for us to sit on where we were almost opposite the town hall. The cheering, shouting and groans were wonderful and went on all the time with great vigour until at last people yelled and hurrahed and shouted in one steady roar calling, Fry, 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 we all nearly had a fit and we knew it was all right. And so began Frederick Fry's... Uh, uh, career as a Liberal MP. He'd earned uh, the Liberal candidature for the relatively new seat of Kensington North by way of membership of first uh, the Metropolitan Board of Works. He was a vestryman for Kensington and then of his successor, the London County Council. And on the LCC, he'd been a member of the Progressives. And in the new Parliament, in which the Liberals and their Irish allies uh, um, had a majority over the Conservatives and Liberal Unionists, he was one of the group of London radical liberal members that included Keir Hardy, John Burns, and John Benn, the grandfather of Tony. Uh, at that time, social reform for the working class was not uh, quite yet identical with the claims of Labour with a small L, though it wouldn't be long before it would be so. But Fry was never to join the Labour Party. He was rather a small time uh, and ultimately unsuccessful capitalist. For in 1871, with a brother-in-law, uh, he'd set up in business as a grocer. From small beginnings, the firm was called Leverett and Fry. It had expanded rapidly. One of the first firms to create a, a series of shops, a, a chain of stores. And one of the earliest at, uh, uh, was at 19 All Saints Road in North Kensington. And uh, here it is, as I photographed it uh, and, um, I mean, it's still there. The shop is, even the, the front, I should think, is the same uh, as it was. It had opened in 1873, and it was in a flat above the shop um, that in 1878, Kate Fry was born. Her mother was the younger daughter of a Winchester grocer, and it was the fact that one of her mother's older sisters had married a partner in the firm of W&A Gilby that was to be a major factor in Kate's life uh, for Gilby's dominated the wine spirit market. Uh, they owned uh, vineyards in France and imported wine and distilled gin and whiskey. And Leverett and Fry grocery shops owed much of their success to their position as agents for Gilby's. That's just uh, Kate Roundabout. In fact, it was taken in 1896, but it gives you an idea of uh, what she was like uh, in the years that I'll be speaking about just now. And so in 1892, Frederick Fry took his seat in the House of Commons and he showed his wife and daughters around the Palace of Westminster for the first time a uh, month after his election. And then again in March 1893, when Kate describes how late in the evening after a nine o'clock dinner, we went by train, and that's from um, Notting Hill probably, and uh, after looking around the house, we went up into the ladies' gallery where there was just room enough for us. It was a most interesting and extraordinary debate, first on the payment of members of Parliament and then on something to do with army rations, with the Conservative Party obstructing everything all through the night and morning and using up the time. There were 13 divisions while we were there and we stayed until the end of the house, uh, until the end and the house did not break up until 10 minutes past five o'clock in the morning. At the end, there were only four ladies in the gallery besides ourselves. We got a few biscuits each, but the refreshment place was cleared out of everything. I was not a bit tired or sleepy and thoroughly enjoyed it all, 
the speeches were very hot and rowdy. Now, payment of MPs had been one of the planks of the progressives uh, when they were campaigning in 1892, and it was one likely to appeal to a man whose business uh, was, uh, I mean, certainly it would seem that it was being adversely affected by his being M an MP. For it wasn't long after his election uh, that financial difficulties um, caused uh, Leverett and Fry uh, to be formed into a private limited company with Gilby's as the major shareholder. And as a result of this, Fry was eventually to lose um, control of his company. But it was to be another 20 years before MPs were paid. But whatever the reason for being invited to this particular debate, it was clear that Kate Fry, who was then 15, had very much enjoyed her night in the ladies' gallery and was eager to repeat the experience. So later in the year, on September the 1st, um, she writes, Mother Agnes and I went to the House of Commons, got there at five o'clock. It was a closure of the third reading of the Home Rule Bill. It was all most exciting, and the ladies' gallery was crammed. Agnes and I had to go out once for an hour from half past 12, and we sat outside the door of the ladies' gallery on a seat there. Then two ladies came out, so we went in again. We had something to eat in the ladies' room about half past eight. We waited till the end. It was after two o'clock when we got in. And here you can see the page of her scrapbook in which she uh, pasted in her souvenirs of the day. And in the following, uh, the page that follows in the, the scrapbook, uh, she actually pasted in uh, the voting record of each MP for that debate. And Frederick Fry had, of course, voted uh, in favor of the Home Rule Bill's third reading. But at the next general election, in 1895, despite uh, fighting a strong campaign, and here you can see two of his uh, uh, flyers, again uh, um, preserved by Kate. I do like the one on the left. You see, a lot of thought went into that. <laughs> uh, he, anyway, Fry lost North Kensington to the Conservatives, who in fact uh, got overall control of uh, the House of Commons. However, the family continued to be deeply involved in local politics in North Kensington, and Fry became an alderman, and um, Mrs. Fry was president of the North Kensington Women's Liberal Association, regularly holding meetings in the family drawing room, which was now at 25 Arundel Gardens, which was a larger, smarter house with no attached shop, um, into which they'd moved not long after his um, election. And on occasion, Kate went with her mother um, to some of these meetings. And she wrote of this one, on Friday the 20th of March, 1896, uh, um, she attended uh, a North Kensington Women's Liberal Association drawing room meeting to hear Mrs. Henry Fawcett lecture on women's suffrage. Mother took the chair. Mrs. Fawcett speaks well, but she did not seem to go down very well at the meeting. She is very much a conservative, except on this one subject, which with, with her way of looking at it, isn't very liberal either. Only the lady householders to have votes. You see, that won't quite do for us. If they have it at all, they ought to have them as the men do. Altogether, I didn't care for the evening. By 1896, I mean this time, the women's suffrage campaign had already been running for 30 years. Its aim was to achieve for... Uh, women the same right to a parliamentary vote as that enjoyed by men. And throughout the, 19, the second half of the 19th century, campaigners had lobbied steadily, if unsuccessfully, using all the constitutional methods at their disposal and forming a succession of societies which developed on an ad hoc basis, which were dynamic, uh, interactive, and reactive. And most of the members of these societies were committed in one way or another to the Liberal Party. The Fry family's politics, uh, as Kate's diary, show, diary shows, was at the radical end of the liberal spectrum, and Mrs. Fawcett's was at the conservative. At the time of this uh, 1896 uh, meeting, the two liberal extremes, as exemplified in the views of Kate Fry and Mrs. Fawcett, were represented by two different suffrage societies, which had formed after a split in 1888, which in part uh, reflected the fissure in the Liberal Party over Home Rule. In 1897, however, 
they agreed to harness their resources in order to work together more effectively and they formed um, an umbrella organisation called the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, which I'll refer to uh, in such a mouthful uh, by the acronym of NUWSS. And over the next uh, several years, uh, though Kate makes no more mention of women's suffrage, she became increasingly caught up in her devotion to the theatre. For in 1902, she decided to place herself on the other side of the footlights, and she trained at the Ben Greet Academy, um, as another would-be actress, Sybil Thorndike, was to do the following year. But Kate wasn't actually in the Thorndike League, although she did get some employment with touring companies and travelled around uh, England, Ireland, and Scotland. And during her time on tour, she became engaged to a fellow actor, John Collins. It was to be a very long engagement. Acting didn't pay. And after three years or so, Kate more or less abandoned the stage and began to spend more time at home. And it was while living at home, I mean, they were still living in Arundel Gardens then, that in early 1906, she canvassed energetically at the general election for North Kensington's successful Liberal candidate, H.Y. Stanger. And during the campaign, she met and became friendly with two uh, co-workers uh, who were sisters, Alexandra and Gladys Wright, who rather unusually for Kate's uh, circle were graduates. And uh, on the 26th of April 1906, during a social even, evening given by her mother for uh, the North Kensington Women's Liberal Association, Kate noted that there was a little discussion of what took place in the house last night, the disgraceful disturbance kicked up by some women during the women's suffrage debate. Mrs. Stanger had a letter from her husband on the matter, and the Mrs. Wright, who came as our guest, spoke. It really was awfully comical. No one showed any sense of humour. This is the first mention by Kate of what was to become uh, constant during the next few years, the activities of the militant suffragettes, members of the Women's Social and Political Union formed in 1903 by Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst. In this instance, members of the WSPU sitting in the ladies' gallery had made a vociferous uh, protest when a resolution which was brought by Keir Hardy uh, in favour of women's suffrage was being talked out. But by um, the end of 1906, although she was interested in the subject, but probably not convinced uh, by WSPU's militant actions, Kate had joined the Central Society for Women's Suffrage under the umbrella of the NUWSS, and was a the society was a descendant of the one for which Mrs. Fawcett had spoken to her in 1896. And in fact, her, Kate's um, joining the society was all part of the, the general um, interest in suffrage that had been really inspired by the WSPU, but not everybody wanted to be militant. And uh, the, her society, the Central Society, by 1907 was renamed the London Society for Women's Suffrage, just to get that clear, because I'll refer to it as that afterwards. Um, and. Uh, As the women's suffrage campaign became more public, Kate's interest uh, grew, and in February 1907, <coughs> she took part in the first public procession staged by the NUWSS through the muddy, wintry streets of London, and it became known as the Mud March, for obvious reasons. And she wrote, We were an imposing spectacle, all with badges, each, each section under its own banner. I felt like a martyr of old and walked proudly along, it did seem an extraordinary walk, and it took some time as we went very slowly, but we went in one long, unbroken procession. And these are flyers that, I mean, they're very scarce. I don't think I've ever seen them before. I mean, they have just got thrown away in the mud, I should imagine, but she preserved them in her diary. So. Anyway, in the following months, Kate followed the progress of suffrage bills, and this is the one that her own MP, Stanger, um, brought into the, to the House. And uh, she also attended suffrage drawing room meetings, read palms at fundraising bazaars, that was her speciality, and on occasion delivered leaflets to houses and flats in North Kensington, and here I think of uh, contemporary canvases, because she did lament the number of stairs she had to climb up and down all these uh, mansion 
blocks of flats. And in the autumn, she stewarded at the annual meeting of the London Society for Women's Suffrage, and at the end of the year, at a particularly disorderly meeting held at Paddington Baths, where Mrs Fawcett was again the speaker, but here medical students from St Mary's Hospital released mice and firecrackers, and as Kate remarked, it was bedlam let loose. Although a member of a constitutional society, in March 1908, Kate was very happy to attend a meeting organised by the militant WSPU, finding it was all just a little too theatrical, but very wonderful. Miss Annie Kenny interested me the most. She seemed so inspired, quite a second Joan of Arc. I was very, not, very pleased not to be missing so wonderful an evening. Can you see that in the slide? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's uh, again very scarce. I've never seen this leaflet before. But in June, the NUWSS staged a spectacular summer procession featuring magnificent banners which were designed by uh, one of the new uh, suffrage societies, the Artist Suffrage League. And Kate was very proud to carry the one for North Kensington. And you can still see the design for this banner, although the banner itself has disappeared, but the design is held in the, um, the, the Women's Library. And after the long march uh, from the embankment, she described how I got in the Arbit Hall about 5.15 and they started the meeting just as I sank down. I must own to feeling completely done when I left the banner. I got cramp in both feet at once and felt a thousand, but I dashed into the hall, found the seat of my box with the rights, and Alexandra, like an angel, got me a cup of tea. She, Gladys, and another girl looked most awfully charming in cap and gown. Uh, the graduates were always remarked in processions. The following year, Kate uh, was naturally interested in the new suffrage society that had been formed, the Actresses Franchise League, and, uh, which represented uh, women in the theatrical profession. And at her first AFL meeting in March 1909, she was introduced to the actress Eva Moore, of whom she wrote, She didn't seem to like me much, but I'm used to treating all suffrage women as merely women, not little queens. In the same month, she spent a morning standing outside Chancery Lane Tube with Alexander Wright, handing out suffrage leaflets. It was curious work, and a bitter wind blew on us, but the men were really quite nice, and we had no unpleasant experience. I suppose people are getting used to suffragettes. Later in the year, while living in the country house her family had for years uh, leased on the River Thames at Bourne End, Kate refused to help the local Liberal candidate at the forthcoming general election. I had to explain that as a keen suffragist, I could not do anything to help the present member, Mr Herbert. He is so very anti. But she did canvass North Kensington and Islington for signatures for a petition organised by the NUWSS. It was signed by 280,000 male voters and presented to the House of Commons in March 1910, but did nothing to change government policy. And it was this understanding that the government would just continue in this state of complacent and intransigence that now led the Wright sisters, together with other former members of the London Society for Women's Suffrage, to found a new uh, suffrage society, which was rather prosaically named the New Constitutional Society for Women's Suffrage. They explained that the powerlessness of the private member in the House of Commons to pass any bill into law which has not been accepted by the government of the day renders it absolutely necessary to direct all av available force to the conversion or coercion of the government only. And for this reason, the NCS has adopted what is known as the anti-government policy. And now, the NCS was in fact carrying out the election policy of the WSPU, whose motto was, keep the Liberal out, but eschewing the WSPU's other weapon, militancy. By resolving to work against the government, that's the Liberal candidates, uh, it was going further than the current NUWSS policy, which was only to do so when the candidate did not include support for women's suffrage in his election address. In April 1910, the NCS opened a London office at Mar Park Mansions Arcade, which ran between uh, Knightsbridge and Brompton Road, underneath a newish block of flats. And these premises are now incorporated in a large Burberry uh, store. For then as now, Knightsbridge was a distinctly shopping area and was not one favoured by any other suffrage societies, all of which were now positioned in business areas. And over the years, the NCS expanded its Knightsbridge offices, but never opened branch offices in towns outside London, as did the other suffrage societies. Um, it all, all its branches operated from the homes of its members. 
In February 1910, members of the House of Commons had formed what was termed the Conciliation Committee to prepare a private member's suffrage conciliation bill. And after the bill passed its first reading in June, uh, the WSPU and other societies mounted yet another spectacular procession through London to give maximum publicity to the campaign. This time, to her delight, Kate uh, marched with the actresses. Everyone was interested in us, and sympathisers to the cause called out, well done, actresses. <laughs> but in November, the hopes of the suffrage campaigners were dashed when at a meeting in Caxton Hall, members of the WSPU and sympathisers heard the news that with the two houses locked in the battle for supremacy, Parliament was to be dissolved. This meant the conciliation bill would be killed. In retaliation, the WSPU immediately ended its truce and prepared to resume militant tactics. In groups of 10, a deputation of 300 women set out from Caxton Hall for Parliament and they encountered violence in Parliament Square that, such as they'd never previously come across. And this day has gone down in suffrage history as Black Friday. Kate was there. This is the flyer that she preserved in her diary. And uh, it's, uh, you can see how roughly uh, printed, again, I've never seen uh, one of those. And she wrote a very long, very detailed description of the day. Uh, uh, again, as an observer rather than an uh, active participant, but she describes how I first reached the wall of the moat at the angle so I could see the door plainly, and Mrs. Pankhurst and the elderly lady, that was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, sister of Millicent Fawcett. Then I saw policemen breaking up the little standards held by a group of women. I saw deputations pass along and ugly rushes, and ever the crowd grew. It was a most horrible experience. I've rarely been in anything more unpleasant. It was ghastly, and the loud laughter and hideous remarks of the men, so-called gentlemen, even of the correctly attired, top-hatted kind, was truly awful. Her lengthy description was not written uh, with hindsight or with an eye to posterity, and can be taken as a true enough account of uh, the proceedings. As a result of what she witnessed, Kate uh, resigned from the NUWS and joined the WSPU, but she did remain a sympathiser rather than an activist. And in the campaign leading up to the second general election of uh, that year, that's 1910, two elections, 1910, volunteered to work for the NCS with her friends, the Wright sisters. And all, at the same time as all this was going on, the Fry family finances were now so powerless, um, the, Fry had lost control of uh, the company and they were deeply in debt. And it was necessary to give up living in London and retreat to Bourne End. And a very early entry in Kate's 1911 diary made the position clear. Monday the 2nd of January. It was a real black Monday. We discussed and discussed our affairs for hours and we seemed in a more terrible way than I thought. A most hapless muddle, debts, 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 and only about £400 a year for us all to live on. It hardly seems possible. Fry had resigned as a director of uh, Leverett and Fry and was making desperate attempts to raise money. And Kate trailed around theatrical agencies and theatres seeking stage work, but all to no avail. But then, in early March, was very much relieved to be offered uh, paid employment by the new Constitutional Society for Women's Suffrage. And from now until mid-1915, she was a paid organiser for the society. She didn't have any training, uh, but as we've seen, she was accustomed to canvassing at elections, and her experience of theatrical touring had prepared her for the itinerant aspect of the new employment and the lodgings. And the salary of two pounds a week was the rate that was paid to organisers from other suffrage societies. So in March uh, 1911, Kate sent, was sent off to Norfolk. And now, it's never explained why the society thought that the small, albeit thriving, market town of East Deerham should be the, one of the main centres of their propaganda efforts. But it was to there that Kate was first sent and uh, to there that she returned on numerous occasions for quite uh, lengthy periods of time. And she also spent time in Essex villages in Lurstoff, Folkestone, Hythe, Rye, Reading, Wantage, and many small towns in between, living in digs, cheek by jowl with other boarders, vicars, school teachers, even a budding international pianist, all of whose quaintnesses, as she would term it, she confided to her diary. Now, the role of uh, the organiser was to um, stage meetings in drawing rooms and public halls, and these are flyers that she got printed for the first two 
very first meeting which organized um, meetings on village greens and marketplaces, seaside piers. She had to find suitable chairmen for the meetings, which was always a problem. Had to welcome and find accommodation for the speakers um, and had to put up with their foibles. And by her account, they certainly did have some. Despite uh, uh, Kate's best attempts at canvassing, some meetings were disastrously ill-attended and attracting the ire of the visiting speaker. And some meetings were sublimely surreal. For instance, in June 1912, she welcomed to East Dereham the Reverend Hugh Chapman, chaplain of the Royal Chapel of the Savoy, who was a recent convert to suffrage. He'd sweet-talked her on a previous occasion, and now when she met him at the station, she wrote, he clasped me by the hand and arm, telling me he'd come for the pleasure of seeing me. The journey had been nothing but the reward of seeing me at the end. And then she left Chapman at his hotel, and she went back to the hall where the meeting was being held. I must say, I felt a little light-headed. The greeting had absolutely gone to my head. I hovered up and down stairs till 8.30. A clergyman and party had driven up at 8 o'clock, and Mr Davidson from Stukey, a friend of Mr Chapman's, and they'd gone off to fetch him. I lived on thorns until his arrival. They brought him in the motor. I found some seats for his friends in the front row. A most frivolous clergyman with a frivolous wife and a beyond all hooping frivolous young lady destined for the stage. The whole party seemed quite mad. I heard Mr Chapman telling the audience how he admired Miss Fry and how he had come to speak for me, a woman of heart and brain and altogether the right sort. He spoke of his ideal mother and the ideal woman as if he had last found her. So no wonder people looked at me. He went on to speak magnificently as one inspired. It was a tremendous success. And then eventually to bed, but not to sleep. Oh dear, no. For despite Kate's long-term engagement to John Collins, she always had a soft spot for a man such as Hugh Chapman who had a way with words. And these were the perils of an organiser's life. But as a side note, we can see how perspic perspicacious Kate's judgment of character was. For 20 years later, that Mr Davidson, the most frivolous clergyman from Stukey, was defrocked, having been found guilty on charges of immorality. And penniless, he took to the public entertainment circuit as Daniel in the lion's den, the end coming at Skegness when the lion turned. But most meetings were not so electric, and Kate was pleased when the daily grind of the organiser's life was punctuated by the short, sharp thrill of the by-election, such as uh, one that was held at Reading in November 1913, which was a particularly rowdy example. And the rowdiness was perpetrated in public by the audience and in private by her visiting speakers. On one occasion, Kate wrote in her diary that one of these speakers, Mrs. Merrillville Mayor, refused to chair a meeting, quoting... She was sick of the NCS, she shouted out, both she and Miss McGowan, another uh, member of the organi NCS organising staff, shed tears of rage, were violently rude to one another and walked away. To cap it all, when Kate did get a semblance of a meeting underway, she describes how the free cin cinematograph displayed by the Daily Mail uh, started its funny series of pictures. The crowd was dense, but all turned to the pictures. Miss McGowan and Miss Merrival Mayor both went off to London on the 944 train. Such a relief to get them both out of Reading. <laughs> and a few days later, on Guy Fawkes' night, she describes another outdoor meeting. Oh, it was so rowdy. The hooligans with squibs and crackers and tin trumpets and rattles. Oh, it was a noise. I did have a task with the boys. It managed them fairly well. I had a horrid wad of something soft and squashy strike me in the mouth but I just took my handkerchief and wiped it off and I could see the crowd was with me. The boys, however, never got a squib under my skirt, so I walked away in time. Well, it was exciting. But for the most part, life was not so stimulating. Long days were spent in the somewhat thankless task of knocking on doors and trying to interest householders in votes for women. Or as Kate wrote one day in February 1914 in Reading, Canvas Cavisham Road in the morning, and bawled at people in their doorways as the trams clanged past. Although not involved in militancy, Kate felt its effect. People turned against suffrage as the WSPU campaign increased in ferocity. For instance, in December 1912, while trying to organise meetings in Dover, she mentions, I went out to see a Miss Robinson, whose uncle was going to give a suffrage party, now won't owing to the letterbox demonstration. 
This refers to the fact that a few days earlier, WSPU members had destroyed thousands of pieces of mail by pouring acid and tar, etc., into post boxes in London and uh, other cities around the country. But though she took no part in militancy, uh, Kate was swept along by its more theatrical aspects. And on uh, Monday, 9th of June, 1913, while at Deerham, she noted the death of Emily Wilding Davison, uh, the woman who threw herself in front of the king's horse at the Derby, she writes. And on the next Saturday, she hurried up to London, having bought a black hat and arranged for a black coat and skirt to be sent to lodgings. And from there, with her fiancé, she set out to follow Emily Wilding Davison's funeral procession. We walked right down Buckingham Palace Road and joined in the procession at the end. It was really most wonderful, the organised part. Groups of women in black with white lilies in white and in purple and lots of clergymen and special sort of pallbearers each side of the coffin. She comments on the crowd, Oh, what a quantity of people filled the windows and pavements in Bloomsbury. Near King's Cross, the procession lost all semblance of a procession. One crowded process. Everyone was moving. We found ourselves in King's Cross Station. We went on the platform, and there was the train, the special carriage for the coffin, and finding a seat, sank down and did not move until the train left. Lots of the processionists were in the train, which was taking the body to Northumberland for internment, and another huge procession tomorrow. I was so tired, I felt completely done. We found our way to the refreshment room, and there were several of the pallbearers having tea. Now, Kate's diary never fails to deliver such inconsequential details among the theatrical set pieces, and it's these that I feel strengthen the diary's veracity. And Kate carried on working for the NCS, from now mainly based in London, laterally as a society's secretary. The need for paid employment to become more urgent than ever, as um, the Fry's uh, were family uh, were finally forced to give up their born end home and sell off most of their possessions and move into rented rooms. And in early 1940, not long after this, Frederick Fry died. Um, the outbreak of war seems, from the evidence of her diary, to have taken Kate unawares, as it presumably did most of the population. Still caught up in the suffrage struggle, and she was uh, canvassing all around uh, London at the time. It's only around the 25th of July that she begins to mention what she terms European complications. And barely uh, three weeks later, the NCS, like other suffrage societies, had put its campaigning on hold and turned its attention to the war effort. Kate's role was as an organiser of a workroom set up in the Knightsbridge office to give employment to dressmakers, put out of work as the demand for women's clothing went into a dramatic, albeit temporary, decline. The thinking was, of course, if they didn't have employment, these poor women, they might end up on the streets and this is, they were doing their bit. At this time, she was living in one rented room in Pimlico and was well-placed to describe wartime London. Um, for instance, went down beside the LCC dock station and saw the Belgian refugee camp in Hudson's depository, uh, furniture depository, that is. Poor souls, they do look miserable. Boy scouts on guard and ladies and officials in and out. Lots of company of soldiers about everywhere. Bands playing, bayonets gleaming. Finally, the prospect of... Uh, uh, life in a rented room, combined with the fact that John, now an officer, was for once reasonably well paid, and uh, he looked rather handsome in khaki, decided Kate that after, and it was Kate who decided, that after an 11-year engagement, they should now marry. And the wedding took place in uh, January 1915 on her 37th birthday. John then went back to his army uh, at training, and Kate carried on working in the NCS office. And in July 1915 came her final active participation in the suffrage movement. On a wet uh, Saturday in July, she took part in the Right to Work march organised by Mrs Pankhurst at Lloyd George's behest to encourage women to uh, enter munition factories. But soon afterwards, Kate succumbed to an unexplained illness and resigned from the NCS. However, she did maintain an interest in suffrage, and on the 7th of February, 1918, wrote in her diary, a day of excitement. It felt like someone's birthday, a personal affair, but in truth it was the birthday of a great new era. Saw the Daily Telegraph for the announcement of the passing into law of um, the Franchise Bill and Votes for Women. 
And in fact, the NCS had played a very active part in the negotiations that resulted in women over 30 being included in the franchise. Uh, and, but then uh, its work uh, done, it disbanded, and Kate was present at, it, at its final meeting. But much to her regret, she had no immediate opportunity to use this hard-won vote for when the, the general election was called. She was living in a house close to Vaughan End, owned by a, a Gilby aunt, and here the local MP, who was a conservative, backed by the Lord, Lloyd George Bonalore um, coupon, um, he wasn't opposed, so there was no contest. However, she was delighted by the writing of Asquith and, as she says, his wretched set of followers. When she did come to cast her first vote, it was at a general election in 1924. It was back in North Kensington, where she and John were renting a flat. And she wrote, polling day, election seems somehow in my blood. I don't feel at all comfortable while they're going on. At 1.30, off to the free library in Ladbroke Grove to vote for Mr. Percy Gates. Much relish in voting, but little in recording a vote for Mr. Gates. It is a straight fight this year, Conservative and Labour, and Gates was the Conservative candidate. And uh, two years later, Kate and John watched, and John took snapshots of, and these are very rare, I've never seen other photographs of these, one last suffrage march the Equal Rights Procession, which was part of the campaign to persuade the government to give votes for women at 21 and uh, for peeresses in their own right uh, to be given a seat, voice and vote in the House of Lords. And Kate wrote, went by bus to Marble Arch and walked to High Park Corner, saw the procession of women for equal franchise rights and to the various meetings and groups, heard Mrs. Pankhurst and she was quite delightful. I mean, she's so, even just shortly before her death, Mrs. Pankhurst is so idiosyncratic. I mean, you pick her out, there she is standing. And two years later, Kate placed a newspaper cutting about Mrs. Pankhurst's death in the front of that year's diary. And on Monday, June the 18th, 1928, describes going to St. John's Church, Smith Square, had no ticket, but being very early, before 10, I was let up in the gallery of the church and sat over the chancel and in front of Mrs. Pankhurst's coffin. The flowers were marvellous, most beautiful, a wonderful service, but very sad, sad in itself, and to see and feel us all so old and grey and ill. A bus to Brompton Cemetery, an enormous crowd there, followed the coffin and saw the end, then got away. And Kate note made no mention two weeks later of the passing on the 2nd of July 1928 of the representation of the People Equal Franchise Act that finally gave votes to women on the same terms as men. A chapter in her life had closed. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. That was excellent. We'll look forward to the publication. Have you got a date for that? Yes, it's 15th of January. 15th yeah. of January. Okay. Yeah. Too, late, too late for Christmas, but yes. good enough for birthdays. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. We've got a few minutes uh, for questions. And um, Emily, uh, sorry, not Emily. I'm thinking of Pankhurst now. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie has the, has the microphone. Um, hi there. Can you tell me... Can you tell me how you came across these diaries and, um, and how you found yes, them? Yes, it is an interesting story, and uh, it's all thanks to the Women's Library, in fact, because what happened was, uh, it's 2008, I can't remember, 2009, I got an email one uh, Friday afternoon from Anna Kisby, who was leaving the Women's Library uh, to have a baby, and uh, she just said, you might be interested in these diaries which are in a... a cellar running with wet in North London, um, that people had got in touch, the people who owned the diaries had got in touch with the library a few years before, and um, Anna had um, been deputed to investigate, and she looked at it and made a report, and it being considered. Now, this volume, I, well, I brought it along because it's in good condition, but they're boxes and boxes. I mean, they, as I say, they cover her own life, and they've been kept uh, in... Well, they were running wet, I mean, literally running wet. They'd been, um, I mean, there, there is a, a history of, I've, I've managed to trace more or less, but I, the people who had the, 
the, um, the diaries, they had no connection with Kate Fry. I think uh, somebody had been a house clearance person and they cleared them out and hadn't known what to do with them and they just sat them and in fact it was the son of this person. So it was a great way removed. Um, so the library turned them down regretfully, I think, just simply because of conservation. No, they couldn't, it would just be too expensive. And some of them, I mean, uh, there were some photographs that I just couldn't keep, they were falling apart. And some of the, the diaries, the later ones from the 40s and 50s are, are quite badly, badly damaged. But anyway, wearing my, it was wearing my book dealer, because that's another thing I do, I um, decided that I bought them. But uh, then um, once I'd got them home and uh, set them all out and dried them all round, not terribly expertly, I'm sure a conservationist would have probably had a kit of this, but um, I then started reading them and got hooked and just realised how valuable all this information was. I, I mean, I don't know, as I say, of any other diary that covers all this material in such, a, such detail. I mean, usually suffrage diaries deal with prison and all the high points, but this is the day-to-day -day life, and uh, you see what it's like uh, organising in Folkestone. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> no, no. That, uh, I don't think it was particularly from lack of choice. I mean, from choice, but uh, I don't know. They had, they had no money. I mean, anyway, they, they lived. Um, her husband, after he did, he got an MC during uh, the war. She was very pleased with that. Um, and uh, he uh, then went back to being an assistant stage manager and uh, very little uh, money, and uh, they very, live very frugally, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, what about her sister Agnes? Did, did oh, poor she Agnes, no, no. All? She went on the mud march, but most of the time she was too seedy, always feeling very seedy. And she, um, at one point in the 20s, when they lived in, um, they had a flat in North Kensington, as I say. They lived in, uh, otherwise, it was at a place above uh, Bourne End, uh, uh, Burgess Hill, which is a tiny little village at the back of beyond, but it was Gilby country, so they had a sort of grace and favour house there, and Agnes and her mother lived there as well. Um, but they had a flat in North Kensington, and their doctor for a while was Dr Ethel Bentham, um, LCC um, MP as well, um, and uh, Labour. Uh, and it's quite interesting because Kate occasionally gives verbatim her reports. You know, obviously it's pull yourself together a lot of the time. Um, but Agnes, she she was very worried because Dr. Bentham had said that she couldn't hold out any hope for Agnes unless she had some occupation. I mean, once uh, once it became obvious she wasn't going to get married and the family money had all gone, she just gave up really, and she. She died in the 30s. She just sort of drifted into death, as far as I can tell, without anything particular. Yeah. Yes, but it's an interesting story in itself, really. Yeah. It's beginning to sound as though there's a film in there. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone else want to? OK, if there, yeah. if there aren't any other questions, um, can I once again thank, uh, thank Elizabeth for her contribution. It's been a fascinating evening, and uh, um, I look forward to the book being published. And, uh, in the meantime, those of you who are interested, the, the, when, you, when you walk down, to, you can walk the central lobby to see the permanent women and vote display. Uh, most of you who, who are in the, the, the house will be familiar with that. Um, and I'm, I'm told that as well as walking in the footsteps of the women who fought for the vote as shown on the map in the leaflet, um, the, the, there is that display. And we will be um, organising, the, the, the Arts Committee will be organising a display um, later in next year to commemorate the, the, the death of Emily Wilding Davison. Um, and her scar the scarf that she wore is actually part of the, uh, when she was killed, is actually part of the exhibition that you can see there. So thank you everyone uh, very much for coming along. I'm told that by magic that...